So hi everyone, welcome to the Essex Seminar Series. My name is Kazi. Um, I'm going to be moderating today's seminar. Uh, just as a note, this uh, seminar is recorded um, and will be posted on our YouTube channel after uh, probably a couple of days. Um, but that link is in the uh, initial seminar email. Today, um, we're welcoming Dr. Uh, Sue Ellen Haupt from NCAR, um, who's going to talk to us about applying machine learning in the environmental sciences. And at the end, we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, so thanks. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Ralph for the introduction. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be brief. So yeah, um, we have a, a really distinguished uh, speaker today, and we're excited to, about the topic she's going to talk about. Um, she's um, a senior scientist at NCAR, and, uh, um, expert in uh, mesoscale models and, and using AI. Um, she's got quite a few um, uh, honor. She's a fellow of the AMS. Uh, she's a commissioner of the AMS Commission uh, on Weather, Water, and Climate, and um, right. it's also contributing and funding director of the World Energy and Meteorology Council. Um, I did a little research. So she's got uh, degrees from Penn State, uh, Worcester Polytech, and um, University of Michigan. Um, and uh, we're just going to turn it over to her and um, listen to her exciting talk. Well, thank you, Ralph and Kazi. I really appreciate the invitation to uh, speak with such an illustrious audience. Um, and today I'm going to talk about machine learning and how it's evolved over the years. So um, I plan to start by talking about the past a little bit, the history, it really is not a brand new field. Then go in, talk about some of the applications that are making a big splash these days, and then look at where we're going in the future. So part one, history of AI. If we look at artificial intelligence broadly, um, in around 1950, Alan Turing proposed the Turing test and determined that uh, you know, we wanted to build a computing system where an observer could not distinguish between an answer by a person versus a computer. And of course, this was back in 1950, some time ago, um, and it took quite a while to get there. In the same year, Claude Shannon began to program computer chess. And of course, um, you know, Shannon, uh, Shannon in information theory, quite famous. But it wasn't until really in 1956 that John McCarthy convened the Dartmouth conference that they coined the term artificial intelligence. That was um, the founding fathers. They had a summer conference um, and it was all men back then. And thus ensued this great excitement about artificial intelligence. Defense departments started spending a lot of money on it in the US as well as elsewhere. Um, and it focused a lot on language translation as well as heuristics, things like designing expert systems with a lot of if-then statements initially. But the problem when a, a, an area seems like it's going to be really, really hot is sometimes people overpromise, especially on things like translation and that. So when you look at the history of AI, not only were there some boom periods, but there were also bust periods, what are often referred to as the AI winters, where especially um, you know, whenever the DOD decided that they weren't getting the language translations as fast as they want, then they quit funding for a period of time. And during those periods, you found that AI became a bit of a dirty word. That's when we started to use other, um, other words instead. That's when machine learning became to be used as well as calling things informatics, pattern recognition, knowledge-based systems. And the favorite that I used um, in, a, in, in the second winter was statistical learning. Um, all kind of saved the place. You could do uh, the machine learning research. But then in 1997, when uh, Deep Blue beat Gary, uh, 
Basharov, and then in 2016, more recently, AlphaGo came up with strategies human players couldn't, and the initialization of deep learning, um, AI, machine learning are really off and running. And that's when it became exciting. But note that even in uh, you know the the deep learning that uh, beat AlphaGo, they used reinforcement learning of certain policy networks that were designed by humans, and it was a supervised learning of their value networks. It leveraged the human knowledge, despite being primarily. Uh, machine learning. Well, what about in environmental science? We weren't part of it back in the 1950s, but we did follow later on. And this comes from a paper I, I wrote, um, you know, just a year or so ago with a bunch of other, um, you know, previous chairs of the AMS, Artificial Intelligence Committee, that really looks at, on the bottom, we show the uh, general uh, booms, busts, uh, the AI winters. But then we look at what happened in the environmental sciences above. And we see that we had the first AI um, in research conference in the environmental sciences back in 1984. So we've been doing AI in these types of topics before. There was a shootout at AMS conferences in 89 and 91. And the first time we really called it an AMS AI conference really didn't happen until in around 2000. That um, AMS committee was formed, began to teach short courses, uh, started holding AMS contests, and we started um, establishing things like the AI to ES Environmental Sciences um, project that is based in Oklahoma. Amy McGovern leads that and held an AI uh, for an Earth System Science Summer School in NCAR that pulled in thousands of people. So this was all happening at the same time that the general advances was happening. Now, the AMS Committee um, on Artificial Intelligence Applications in the Environmental Sciences has been very active in uh, promoting AI, um, taught a lot of short courses, held conferences over the years, and first they were every other year. Um, you know, when I was chair is when we moved to having annual conferences. And that was also the period that we collected a lot of our short course material into a book that was published in 2009. Um, in this BAMS article, we looked at the growth in the environmental sciences, you know, beginning in the late 1990s, how many papers were presented at the AMS conference, you know, it, starting at, it, actually I was surprised 47, then going down a little bit, I started uh, interacting with the committee more in the early 2000s. Uh, but then of course you see it going way up about the time we start using deep learning, 2020 conference in Boston, very high. Bit of a drop due to the pandemic in 2021, back up in 2022, and it was even higher in 2023. Well, what about the evolution of methods used in the environmental sciences over that same time period? Well, we see neural networks, the gray period of this bottom plot, have always been popular. Um, things that have uh, you know, come and gone more tend to be things like fuzzy logic, um, genetic algorithms being used again now though, support vector machines. Then the tree-based methods, the green ones of this plot have always been popular and continue to be. The yellow portion is other AI methods, but then the dark black is the deep learning. And you see that as deep learning came into the mix, um, as the percentage of topics that was that corresponds with the same time period we see in the plot above where more people were interacting. AI is getting popular and we're using it for lots of different uh, purposes that I'll be talking about now. 
Um, so, of course, in Earth system science, a lot of what we do is prediction. And maybe our holy grail is to come up with a machine learning dynamical core. Uh, but then we also have parameterizations as part of our models. So building machine learning parameterizations is certainly a step in the right direction, but the low hanging fruit is the post-processing. So I'll start there and talk about some of the early efforts in post-processing and where it has evolved since then. So um, I had started my own journey in AI uh, back when I was at Utah. Well, actually, when I was a postdoc at NCAR and then continued in the mid 90s. But at the same time, NCAR was building this post processor, the dynamic integrated forecast system, where it takes model output, blends it with observations, and the idea is to produce forecasts of meteorological variables. So what it does, it's, it's a machine learning post-processor of those model data that creates predictive relationships between the model output, the observations, and those desired forecast variables. So it optimizes, it creates the best combination of the inputs. And what it does, it enables decision support works very fast. It can use real-time data to initialize um, the model. In that sense, it really is an internet of things application using SCADA data from multiple sources. And it used large amounts of data, big data application, both in real time, as well as historical data for training, both the model output and the observations. Now, it was originally developed for the Weather Channel, in which, of course, has become part of IBM, now in the process of being divested from IBM. And when they decided to go international in their forecast, they realized they couldn't, um, their human forecasters didn't have the bandwidth to do that. So they came to NCAR's research applications program at that time to ask them to help build this system. Now it's in, used in many projects here at NCAR as the weather engine, such as for surface transportation applications, for uh, solar energy prediction, wind energy prediction, uh, precision agriculture, as well as being used by multiple commercial forecasting companies, including IBM has their own version that they upkeep with their own research now. So what is DiePast? Okay, as I mentioned, we have measurements that go into it. These measurements are first used to bias correct each of the models. Now, when we build a system of diecast, of course we bring in the national models, um, you know, the high resolution models, uh, the global forecast system, uh, usually the Canadian system, often ECMWF. We also often run our own customized version to get those local dynamics. And more recently, we've been including machine learning models that get blended. So as a first step, it bias corrects each of these in a dynamic manner, constantly updating the weights. And as a second step, it, um, it, it calculates optimal weights in the integrator phase where uh, it optimizes those, way, those weights uh, by lead time, by forecast variable, by forecast time. And again, those are updated dynamically um, basically every day. Often we have to post-process it for whatever application we need to come out with the type of variables that um, whoever, th that the user really needs. Now, for um, you know, some of our applications, like in wind energy, uh, this is an example of the type of error uh, characteristics we expect. Root mean square error, the solid dark line is die cast. And uh, you know, the, each of the colored lines represent the bias corrected input models. So you can see that by construction, because we've optimized on average, diecast will always be better than any of the input models. And in the case of wind speed, we find it's typically about 10 to 
100% better than those bias corrected models. Now, when we're building uh, systems like uh, to forecast wind or solar energy um, at NCAR, we tend to use die cast as the centerpiece of the system. But we don't stop there. We have other AI methods, things like uh, short range solar forecasts, um, often expert systems um, that use information upstream. Uh, we've built extreme weather uh, systems, but then we have to convert from the wind to energy. Uh, that's what the users in the utilities want. We do that using machine learning method, as well as doing load estimation and then applying probabilistic methods using AI ra rather than purely running ensembles. So lots of applications of AI. The first system we built um, was in the uh, late 2000s for Excel Energy. Uh, they were the utility that had the highest percentage of wind at in, in, uh, that were, were deployed early. They found they needed to have better forecasts before we started. They had about 17% error by using model output alone. But by 2014, we had gotten that error, error down to 10%. It actually went a bit lower later. That was a 40% improvement. They calculated that it saved them roughly 10 million a year on the day ahead forecast that had added up to over 60 million by that time. But because they were able to use that to integrate the wind and use it more smartly, they also calculated that it saved over 267,000 tons of CO2. So it was real emission savings by, by having these types of blended systems that go beyond the basic models. Now, other examples, um, you know, we worked with DOE for a while to build a solar power forecasting system that we called Sun Forecast. It was comprised of a day ahead system, including diecast, as well as a nowcast system that had several AI methods highlighted in red here, including integrating it, merging the nowcast with the day ahead so that we end up with a consistent uh, seamless forecast, again, converting the power and applying a method for probabilistic power. Now, what about a few of these standalone systems? First of all, let's talk about StatCast, the short range uh, forecasting system that we built at the time. Um, and, and Tyler McCandless was leading that effort right then. He was my PhD student from Penn State. Uh, came to NCAR uh, at the same time I did to work on this project. One thing that we noticed is that there are different regimes that are distinguishable. So can we build a, a regime-dependent forecasting system? And this is a plot of solar irradiance over the course of a day at NREL, so Golden, Colorado. The green curve is the solar irradiance that hits the top of the atmosphere. The blue curve represents what we see on clear days. So even at high altitude locations, we do get um, you know, attenuation due to aerosols and perhaps a little bit of you know, high water vapor, et cetera. On partly cloudy days, you see this red curve. We tend to have clouds come up in the atmosphere in, in the afternoon here in Colorado. And then on one of our few cloudy days, very much attenuated. So looking at this, can we look, build a regime dependent? And indeed we did. So to do a comparison, and, and we're doing this in terms of a variable we call clearness index or KT. And what that does, it looks at the percentage of irradiance that reaches the ground compared to what was at the top of the atmosphere. That way we're able to remove the diurnal cycle that can be calculated. So as a first step, let's just apply a neural net to all the data, predict clearness index, compute our metrics and see what the percent improvement is. The baseline is going to be what we call clearness index persistence. 
here on the right. And what that is, let's just say that uh, the same clearness index persists over a period of time. Again, that removes any uh, diurnal cycle from it. But then the inventive part was, what if we can't classify into regimes? And in particular, using k-means clustering, feed each of the clusters into the artificial neural network separately, separately and then do the clearness index prediction. So when we clustered, you can see that we did get distinct clusters in phase space that then Tyler was able to take and do separately as in this middle part of the chart. And then when we look at the improvement over the baseline, the clearness index persistent, persistence, using all the data in the artificial neural network, we got almost a 14% improvement. But with the regime dependence, we were at 18.6%. So the regime dependence did work when we had a lot of data like that. Now, I mentioned that we also are able to calculate probabilistic information with machine learning. And to do that, we use the analog ensemble um, in a way that was developed by Luca Della Monica at NCAR, uh, widely used also by Stefano Alessandrini. On the left, we're looking at the solar energy prediction. Um, you know, the black curve is worth solar. Uh, you know, the, the physical model. And then we look at, we have two curves, red and blue, the analog ensemble, and then the analog ensemble with a bias correction, both of which do beautifully. We see that we're able to um, get the bias way down uh, by applying this method. But not only that, we build this ensemble um, using looking at historical analogs for similar predictions. We find that when we were able to construct probabilistic information from that ensemble, and in this case on the right, we see the black curve is the observations. Diecast is what we started from, already a machine learning method with a, a good forecast in red. But then the analog ensemble mean is the yellow curve. We did have an improvement there, but we've also used the rest of the ensemble to construct the probabilistic curves, and we are well within those in most cases in this particular example. Now, we, we've been working um, on these types of systems, continuing to advance. One of our recent advances and is a collaboration with the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, building an energy prediction system for them, and of course, bringing in physical models um, you know, setting up WARF, uh, you know, with data assimilation, um, and, you know, running it configured for solar and wind, but then adding in artificial intelligence models too, circled in red, uh, with the centerpiece again being diecast, having statcast versions for both wind and solar, applying analog ensembles for each, but they wanted to look at their wind and solar together. So to combine the probabilistic information, you can't just add probabilities, of course, um, we applied a shocky shuffle technique to combine those, prob those probabilities um, in an effort led by Stefano Alessandrini. Now, that allows us to provide uh, Kisser with a display that is a probabilistic forecast in time of their wind plus solar at once. Okay, the second aspect I'd like to talk about then is what about post-processing for severe weather? Okay, one type of severe weather, especially we know a lot about here in Colorado, is wildland fires. And we do have models here at NCAR, coupled wildland fire uh, atmospheric models, you know, wharf that has been coupled in a way. So not only do the winds push the fire front, but in addition, the fire contributes, contributes mass, momentum, moisture transport to the atmospheric model itself to modify the way the wharf behaves. 
But one of the variables that it is really creates a large uncertainty is the fuel moisture content. Typically, that isn't updated very often at all, you know, every several years. But can we uh, develop a machine learning product based on satellite derived data, you know, MODIS satellite data that would update it on a daily basis? So indeed we did. Our goal was to come up with an update. We brought in data from Wharf Hydro so that we had information on moisture, land use, et cetera, the MODIS satellite data, surface characteristics, things like um, you know, slope of the land, elevation, region, low information, and observations when they would go out in the field and measure fuel moisture content applied machine learning to create those predictive relationships. Um, you know, the initial part of this project was led by Tyler McCandless, Bronco Kosovich managed it and worked with Bill Petsky as well. Um, but they did uh, use both uh, neural nets and um, a, a random forest to come up with estimates of dead fuel moisture content and live fuel moisture content that could be updated on a daily basis across the United States. And during the period of that project, it was available online, um, updated daily. And we found that when using that then in war fire to evaluate it for a particular fire, the Cold Springs fire, and comparing using the constant dead fuel moisture content that we see on the left here, the actual footprint is in black, uh, the modeled footprint is in orange. Um, compare that to what was based on the machine learning, uh, we see that the fire spread was much bigger. And we wanted to see that because the model does not have suppression in it. So we saw that it does allow a much larger advance of the fire to have that updated information. Okay, now let's get into deep learning a little bit. Can we use deep learning to um, improve predictions for severe weather? And in particular then, can we come up with ways to interpret it smartly? So in this case, we start out with radar reflectivity that comes out of the NCAR ensemble run during the spring experiment um, in collaboration with University of Oklahoma. Our goal is to predict the probability of hail greater than or equal to, to 25 millimeters in diameter. So of course, we apply the convolutional neural net, deep learning in a forward manner. Uh, gives the desired label, yes or no, hail, no hail. That was the forward pass. But in addition, can we propagate to update this image? And indeed, this is research uh, led by David John Gagne when he was a postdoc still here at NCAR. And uh, he was able to not only come up with better predictions of hail, but the ability to determine what type of storm um, produced that hail in this back propagation step. So what you're looking here, the top row is one particular uh, hail storm, um, and you, you're looking at it on the left, 500 H Pascal, 700 and 800, so three different levels. And we're seeing here directional shear over the course. We're seeing confluent moist air, very strong lapse rates, known mechanism to produce large hail. But then we look at some of the other hailstones and not all of these have the same pattern. We do in fact sometimes see this dipole pattern that is reminiscent of the grapple hail seeding that was identified by Andy Heimsfeld in 1980, where we get this dipole pattern, very, um, you know, baroclinic type uh, pattern and uh, able to identify that as well. So these neural networks not only produced a more skilled hail prediction, but it additionally enabled to encode the type of storm features that produced the hail growth. 
And by having those internal representations in these deep learning models, we can have more sophisticated analysis of these large scale weather systems. Now, one more application that I always like to show is some work done by Will Chapman when he was still a grad student at um, you know, University of California, San Diego, um, working with his advisors. And this was applying deep learning convolutional neural net to atmospheric river data. Um, he was basing his forecast on GFS output uh, using MARA2 data as the truth, training to historical data, and then applying um, his atmospheric river convolutional neural net is in this bottom. And on the right, we see differences between what his, you know, the, the calculations on the difference. And you'll see the big difference between what MARA and GFS is um, Mara had a phase shift. It, it was wrong, you know, it, 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 the GFS is wrong by a phase rather than an amount in many cases. And we the the art of, uh, the atmospheric river prediction neural net was able to get that phase shift. I thought this was really a large advance where instead of doing merely, point forecast updates and then trying to blend the points, we're doing the phase shifts the entire grid at once. Um, it's really showing promise in being able to advance it. Okay, I mentioned that parameterizations are another use in forecasting. Of course, all our uh, models have, have dynamical cores and then uh, parameterizations of our physical processes. One that we've done here at NCAR is looked at surface layer parameterizations. Now, when you think about what we typically do in models, we apply Monica Lubikoff similarity theory. Okay, so it, it sets up predict it sets up relationships between certain stability functions and heat transfer and momentum and uh, moisture transfer between the surface and the atmosphere, um, you know, based on assumed relationships, but we end up with a lot of empirical coefficients that need to be fit. And most of the fits that we use in our models are based on experiments in the 1960s and 70s in Kansas, you know, very grass experiment, et cetera, but applied everywhere um, across all kinds of surfaces. So the question is, can we use machine learning and real data to come up with something that improves upon Mononubikov in addition to being faster? So to do that, we looked at two data sets, one at Kaba in the Netherlands, they have a 213 meter tower, and one near Schofield, Idaho in the US, and use that to fit both random forest and a neural net. So here are some results. Um, you know, the top we see for the Idaho test set, the bottom is the Kaba test set. The three variables we're calculating are friction velocity, temperature scale, and moisture scale. Um, we're looking at both a correlation, which we want to be as close as one as possible, as well as mean absolute error, which we want to be as close to zero as possible. So Mononubikov similarity, our baseline is the top row, the random forest trained on the data at the same site improves upon that in all cases. But the interesting thing is that when we take the model that was trained at Kaba, apply it to the Idaho test site, it still beats Mononubikov. So we feel like that has been a big advance. So both of those outperform Mononubikov similarity theory, and that's true even when applied to a different site than where it was trained. Now, so a next step is, again, those were, you know, grassland areas. Can we apply it elsewhere? Like for instance, to the ocean surface. Three quarters of the earth is covered by ocean. Can we get data and try to parameterize that? So we got data from the Fino One Tower off Germany, used that. We didn't have moisture um, you know, flux data, but we did have friction velocity, temperature scale, applied 
uh, random forest neural nets again. And we found that once again, that both the random forest and the neural net will outperform Mana Nubikov similarity theory, we ex even more so because we train to more appropriate data here. But the interesting thing is the random forest also comes out um, with uh, you know, a variable importance plot. So we look at what variables were important here. First one, most important is potential temperature at 40 meters. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Mixing ratio. Okay, that's interesting. Water surface temperature, very important. And then wave height. Okay, so we're learning something about the physics by using the interpretability at the same time. I, you know, who would have expected wave height to be that important? Now, again, I mentioned our holy grail is uh, machine learning dynamical cores. A first step in that direction that we've been working on here at NCAR, um, you know, is trying to, uh, you know, look at can you know this is an output from a model, an actual actual challenge run done at thirty meters real resolution um, with Wharf LES, and this is flow in the Lee of Mount Hood coming in from the left, and you can see the meandering wake. Um, you can see uh, traveling gravity waves. You can see stationary gravity waves. Very complex flow. But it also took several weeks on over 8,000 cores of NCAR's Cheyenne supercomputer. So the question is, can we produce similar structure with machine learning? So what we're doing here is applying a deep learning training technique called a generative adversarial ne network. And this is um, you know, work primarily done by uh, Sue Detling, Tom Brummett, with um, you know, consultations with Bronco Kosovich and myself. And the idea is we're going to do a downscale from about one kilometer to 30 meters. And we're doing it in two steps. First, a four times downscale to 240 meters, and then a second step, eight times downscale to 30 meters. So starting with course and data that one can imagine Wharf being run at one kilometer, you know, very fast over that grid. And we find that indeed applying the GANs with starting from this course and data, we're able to produce 30 meters super resolution U wind fields. Now, not only U, we can do all three components. You know, one of our input variables was the terrain elevation. So it's a forced flow. We can look at U, V, W on the left, the course and dwarf, very coarse. The uh, generative uh, enhanced super resolution generative adversarial network at 30 meters in the middle compares very well with the data um, you know, that we, we wish to match. Um, and we can, in, in a matter of seconds, we can generate that 30 meter resolution over the entire domain, again, looking very similar to the original flow field. Okay, so it was able to capture uh, the flow in the area where we trained it. Now, we trained solely on the Eastern portion of the domain in the Lee of Mount Hood. So, and it had, um, you know, the, the uh, ruggedness features that you see on the right part of this plot. The question is, can we then use transfer learning to apply the, the same GAN to a region that it is not seen with a di very different ruggedness measure? And indeed, we did that. So, you know, starting with the coarsened, you know, looking at what we produced, again, it was not trained on this data at all, and comparing to where to our target, we see we are getting very close. Now, that was, you know, just looking at it. You know, we did various metrics. The one that I'll show here is uh, comparing the spectral, uh, you know, TKE plotted as a function of wave number, 
The original LES spectrum is the blue curve here. On the left, this is for the training region. You know, it's independent data that we applied to, to on the training region. And the GAN was able to reproduce it. A bit of loss of, uh, you know, features here um, at some of the mid wave numbers and some spurious high wave numbers. And on the transfer region, we have a little more loss, but not that much. So we're seeing that we're getting that um, high resolution behavior, even where it has not been trained. It gives us a lot of confidence we can transfer it. So one of our more recent applications is, can we apply the same method to hurricane data? So beginning uh, with a 31 meter resolution uh, simulation done by uh, George Bryan here at NCAR was with his uh, Cloud Model 1, can we use that data, uh, coarsen it to one kilometer, train the GAN, uh, so that we produce 31.25 meter data compared to, to his original LES. Again, very similar. This is very preliminary uh, results at this point. Okay, what about climate applications? I've been talking about weather so far, so I'll quickly show um, you know, one climate application we did a few years ago where we had a contract with NREL, a collaboration where we wanted to look at um, you know, the variability of the future wind and solar resource under climate change conditions. So the first thing we did was using um, you know, NCAR's climate four dimensional data simulation database, a reanalysis that NCAR had, had done before then uh, to produce the mean wind and solar distribution under current climate on the left and looking at its variability, plotting it in terms of a standard deviation on the right. Can we produce these similar plots for the future and then look at the change? So to do that, we first calculated self-organizing maps. It's a neural network um, <clears throat> applied to get patterns. And uh, we chose 24 SOMs um, that show patterns that are in this current climate data. We then matched to uh, three GCM regional climate model combinations, looked at the variability in current climate, um, looked at the CRCM-CCSM combination as our primary, but continued with the three. Then we set up rather a complicated method to select Okay, make a long story short, you're welcome to read the paper. Um, we created a regional climate change um, you know, oh, that was cut and diced by 365 regions, you know, four different uh, seasons, uh, several times of day, um, and we're able to look at the percent change in wind and solar over those time periods. Cut to the chase. Because we used the SOMs, we were able to get that variability. We found that the change in the frequency of currents is about plus or minus 10%, occasionally um, up to 20%. Regional changes are within about plus or minus 10%. Largest um, dependency was, we saw biggest dependence on seasonal. So yes, it, yeah, you know, we're applying AI in climate as well. Now, getting to where we really want to be going is the dynamical core. And there is a lot happening in the field um, and in all in the last five years. So in 2018, Peter Dubin and Peter Bauer um, you know, wrote this paper where they built a toy neural net model and they compared it to persistence and a simple T21, similar resolution atmospheric model, similar complexity, and found that this toy model could be competitive um, with forecasts that had similar complexity. That was only five years ago. It really kicked off a lot of research. Um, 
Dale Duran from University of Washington worked with an excellent student that he had, PhD student, Jonathan Wayne. They published several papers. I choose to highlight uh, this one. They were working um, with Rich Karuna and Nathaniel Cresswell Clay of Microsoft. And in, in around 2021, they were publishing uh, these deep learning convolutional neural network models um, you know, built on era five data and showing that it can produce similar scores and probabilistic scores uh, for both four week forecasts and five to six week forecasts as ECMWF's um, subseasonal to seasonal ensembles. And even more impressive, it only took three minutes to produce a 320 member ensemble. Okay, that really kicked it off. Um, you know, I, uh, Dale presented this work at the AMS virtual meeting uh, in 2021, and a lot of people got going after that. We ended up with a recent proliferation of papers. NVIDIA published their forecast net model in February of 2022. Um, Howey, uh, followed in November 2022 on um, presenting Kangu Weather, which they made open source, usable, testable by third parties. Microsoft, and then this summer, there were several published Climax uh, collaboration between Microsoft and UCLA uh, showed up on archive in July. And then Google's paper showed up in August. So we have four different global forecast systems, all very complex, being applied very well. Um, but the question is, okay, so does, you know, they're being claimed to be good by their makers. What about third party comparisons? Well, ECMWF did their own comparison and they started with Tangu Weather as the first available, oops, I, ECMWF blog in June of this summer by some very well-known people. And they, they, they determined that the headline scores of the machine learning models do hold up to independent evaluation and that Tango Weather is a legitimate rival for their, um, their forecast system. When it's applied to things like tropical cyclones, uh, we again see that uh, the, the mean position error, very similar at the very beginning, uh, the IFS high res is better, but then Tangu weather actually gets better uh, beyond about 36 hours. Uh, but they did note the scores can be optimized. Machine learnings are trained to do that, just like we showed for diecast. Um, but training toward that objective can smooth out prediction and penalize forecasts. They looked also more carefully comparing uh, forecast net as well as Pangu weather to their own high res the, and era five reanalysis as well as the analysis and found that they did quite well on getting the centers accurate, but Pangu weather was still un, under predicting wind speed. So can we totally eliminate models? We do know that the machine learning models are trained on the model reanalyses where we blend the data with the model. Generally, you know, we have been trained so far on Aero 5. From ECM's website, they are now running, um, you know, a few of these models daily. Here's Pengu Weather um, from yesterday doing a prediction over Europe and the Western Pacific. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're running this experimental suite. Anybody can come in and look at their comparisons on a day-to-day -day basis and do their own analysis. Now, what showed up even two weeks ago that I think was really impressive and a colleague pointed out to me, Greg Hakem um, of University of Washington collaborating with Sanjit Masanam um, from uh, UCAL Santa Barbara looked at, can they learn some you know, more canonical flows? And they compared to four canonical flows things like uh, tropical heating, hurricanes, extra tropical cyclones, adjustment to geostrophic balance. And we're seeing here in this one, the 
um, the extratropical uh, perturbation did indeed develop um, you know, a wave pattern. It did develop realistic Rossby waves very much in the same way as a physical model would. They concluded that the model encodes realistic physics in their experiments and suggests it as a tool for rapidly testing their ideas. So what do we need to move forward? Um, in late <coughs> 2019, um, I attended a workshop at Oxford convened by uh, Tim Palmer to look at applications of um, artificial intelligence, the group uh, that looked that had a breakout on uh, post-processing got together, wrote a um, a paper for the Royal uh, you know Royal Society philosophical trans transactions. Um, we de we decided that first we need trustworthiness. People aren't going to use machine learning unless it's been thoroughly tested and they trust it. To do that, we require some level of interpretability, explainability, something to convince people that it, why it works. And then we need open data, open models, being able to do these comparisons like are being done now at ECMWF. NOAA is beginning to do their own comparisons as well. And then of course, advancing the techniques. The explosion came with the advent of deep learning, applying it to lots of areas. Um, you know, when are we going to say AI has really landed? And this group decided that when system changes, consider the machine learning post-processed piece in addition to the NWP model alone, making sure that the AI methods have priority for computation space and time as well. Start thinking about the regime dependence of some of our corrections and AI use. Downscaling using AI, save that computational power in various similar ways that I were, was showing that we're testing here at NCAR. And then when I added, um, you know, looking at some of these recent advances, these machine learning model ensembles as forecast systems become part of the forecast. So in summary, I, 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 I claim that machine learning is becoming a necessary component of modern applications. We're beginning to learn physics. Uh, we have lots of levels of applications, dynamical cores, model parameterizations, post-processing. And But that doesn't mean we can ignore the physics. We find the AI met methods work better when blended with the physics. So to advance earth system science, we want to bring in the best of our physics, the best of our observation, and the best of our AI and machine learning techniques. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Helps. Um, so now we can go ahead and do our Q&A session. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, or if you don't have a microphone, then you can put your question in the chat. Um, I did see there was a comment earlier. Um, are you willing to share your slides? Certainly. Oh, great. So um, when I get those slides, I can just go ahead and put them on the uh, seminar website um, for this particular seminar, um, or you can just email me and I'll make sure that's in your inbox. Um, so I see a question from Paige Lavin. Lavin, sorry if I mispronounced that. She says, thanks for a great talk. I'm interested in learning more about the ML surface layer para parameterization for offshore wind work you showed. Is it published already? Okay, no, it is not published yet. We did some initial work that I showed there for the Fino area. We um, are now working on uh, using data um, from the ACIT tower off Martha's Vineyard to do some training. Also uh, looking at both training and testing off the West Coast. Um, we do have a deliverable for a project to publish this by late next spring. So, um, you know, if, if you follow our work, um, you will see it show up eventually. Now, the onshore ones are published in several places. The original paper is led by Tyler McCandless, follow on paper testing it in our um, LES, our, our GPU LES code Fast Eddy. That is a paper led by uh, Domingo Manas Esparza. 
Thank you. Do we have any other questions? You can raise your hand or you can just, everyone can unmute themselves. Go ahead, Peter. Um, hi, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I wanted to know uh, 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 if you could explain why uh, the class uh, for uh, it worked, for example, with uh, Tyler McCandles, uh, uh, or why uh, uh, classifying by K means clustering of the data before feeding it into the neural network improved the model result. Was this due to something like um, uh, is like a, a, a properly weighting the data uh, uh, um, uh, that that made that made the improvement? Okay, so <clears throat> our philosophy here is that because we know the physics of that has various regimes, that it's easier for the neural net to learn um, the behavior if we feed it data from each of the regimes separately. And we found that when you have a lot of data, that is indeed true. But we also, um, you know, and if again, if you read the paper, when we did some data denial experiments, um, as part of that, if you do not have sufficient data, then the regime dependent version will not beat the using all the data version. But um, you know, where you can help the neural net by breaking things down into different physics regimes, um, you can help it basically uh, you know, learn the behavior separately in each of those regimes. And what we were always <clears throat> hoping to do is that, you know, then if you if you apply that to the entire atmosphere, if you think, um, you know, if you're in an NAO uh, phase versus you know a um, you know a different type of um, pattern oscillation, you might be able to separate those, train them separately and get better predictions for certain time periods by doing that. It did work with lots of data on the solar forecasting project. Other people have been doing it, you know, on things like different, um, you know, patterns in the atmosphere as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? You could raise your hand or you could chat me. I'll give you another couple seconds. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, thanks, Kezi. Um, I, I apologize if we covered this. I uh, was sort of sidetracked during the, the presentation, but I really appreciate uh, Dr. Haupt's presentation here. I was just curious about um, prediction of uncertainty, uh, is that one potential application in lieu of say running a full ensemble, um, ML could start to learn uh, predicted or predict uncertainty? Yes, and that was, um, I, I talked very briefly about the analog ensemble as one particular way um, to, come up with a well-calibrated ensemble without running multiple cases. And um, you know, some work done by Luca Della Monica, Stefano Alessandrini, and all their colleagues over the years has pretty much shown that if you apply this method, and what it what the analog ensemble does is it has a historical set of data from the past. It has a forecast for today. So it starts by looking at that historical data to come up with the most analogous forecasts. It construct, it, the ones that are most analogous, um, it then constructs into a historical ensemble. And that can be whatever size you want, say 20 member ensemble. And when they calculate the mean of the ensemble, it is typically better than the raw prediction of the model. And when they calculate uh, the standard deviation and the you know the various percentiles, um, it is it it is typically calibrated at least as well as some of the best baseline ensembles that they've compared to. Um, you know when when using 
probabilistic measures like CPRS, CRQS. Thank so you. One could say then that if an if you're going to you know even run an ensemble, calibrating it using machine learning is a good first step to cut down the number of members you need. But then you go the whole way to applying methods like analog ensemble, then you might be able to run one, use your computer power to run one high resolution member. And then, you know, if you've run it for a sufficiently long time, then construct an analog ensemble to get basically the same results you would with a multi-member ensemble. Thank you. We have any other final questions before we wrap up? I'll give you guys another like 30 seconds to raise your hand. Well, I'm going to take that as a sign that we are done. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you to Dr. Haupt for giving us this great talk. This has been uh, really informative. Everyone clearly liked it. This was a really, um, highly attended talk. So we will continue our seminar series next week. We're resuming um, back to our Monday at two o'clock schedule. Um, and that is uh, Brian Gross. No, it's not. It's Eric Maloney. Brian Gross is the week after that. Okay. Thank you guys. Have a great day. <laughs>